So in this video, I'm going to um, paint this little painting here, which you see here finished. Um, and it's gonna, I wanna demonstrate how to paint wet on dry, which brings up a number of issues, uh, fat over lean, which is something I wanna talk about. But uh, this video is really about me uh, finishing this jar of oil. And it's actually a second video uh, because I have another video, a few videos back where I painted the first layer wet and wet and it looked like this when I was finished. Uh, now that painting is dried out very much and becomes flat and it's ready for a uh, second coat and uh, the finishing coat. Um, so I wanna show you how to do that. But before that, I, let me uh, first of all tell you uh, something that happened. This, I actually posted this video a few days ago and right after we posted it, luckily uh, somebody uh, I was actually going to give this painting away and was going to require uh, uh, that you buy some paint, some Geneva paint, in order to in enter. Well, apparently that's a federal crime, and somebody told me that, so I quickly removed the video, and then I went back to try to thank this person that, that told me about this, and uh, realized that, well, I had deleted the video and I couldn't figure out who it was. So whoever you were, I want to thank you, first of all, for letting me know about that. Uh, it's just something I didn't even think about and had no idea that it was a federal crime to require a purchase for, uh, you know, to, to win a raffle or whatever. But anyway, um, so if whoever that is, if you want to post another comment, I'll, I don't remember what your name was, but I'll recognize your, your little icon. Uh, and, um, you know, we'd like to give you some free paint. Hopefully that's not a federal crime. But anyway, uh, I do still want to give this painting away. And uh, so what I decided I will do is that if you will send us an email and let us know that you want to enter in uh, your name for the raffle to win this painting. The other thing that I'd like for you to do is to post on social media a link to um, drawmixpaint.com, which is my video site. Um, and if you'll do those two things, then we'll enter you, you into a name, your name into a raffle to win this painting, and I will ship it to you anywhere in the world uh, free of charge. So anyway, sorry about that big mix-up, but uh, without further ado, let me get into uh, painting this, um, uh, this oil painting. Oh, before, let me talk about oil, uh, fat over lean, because that's something that comes up anytime you're talking about doing second coats. And for those of you that don't know what fat over lean means, it simply means that every layer of paint, the, the top layer should have a higher oil um, percentage or, or low, lower pigment ratio, to lower pigment to oil ratio than the lower layers. So in other words, when you stain your canvas, you really should be using a very high pigment load, which means a lot of solvent to thin it down, not a lot of oil, so that the layers on top have a higher uh, oil percentage than the layers on bottom. Now, here's the thing about that, is that um, that is very much a rule that you need to obey, but primarily that rule is something you need to think about when you're putting your foundation on your canvas, um, and, and, or if you're putting a stain on it, which is a kind of an overall, you want to make really sure that you use a, and, and if you go to my supply list and look at what I recommend for staining a canvas, um, it's very much a, a, a low oil, uh, you know, stain. Now, so there, then the layers that go on top of that, if you're painting, you know, in multiple, multiple layers, like 10 layers, you know, you get into a lot of issues uh, with layers. Um, I like to work wet and wet. I usually finish my paintings wet and wet and don't come back with second layers like I'm gonna do in this one, but I do it sometimes. Um, and in those cases, I'll just add a couple of drops of uh, linseed oil to, to my paint and so that it has just a little bit higher uh, oil uh, percentage. If you're using a medium that you're mixing into stiff tube paint, you know, uh, just use a medium that's got a little bit more oil in it than the, than the medium you used for the, for the lower layers. Um, but here's the big deal about fat over lean that I don't hear talk to, talk, uh, talking about a lot. And that is that um, the, the, the real issue, if you look at these Sargent paintings, for instance, this, this painting here, if you'll notice where all the cracking is, what's happened is, is Sargent has you know, painted this, come back, and he probably worked on it over who knows how long, but the paint had dried and he came back in and was painting it some more as he was, uh, as he <clears throat> was known to do. And when he painted this area here, 
that's where all this cracking is, he has painted a very fast drying pigment like burn umber on top of a slower drying pigment, which, uh, you know, I don't know what that was. It was, um, you know, could have been even lead white or whatever. Um, and so in that case where you get a fast drying pigment painted on top of a slow drying pigment, it makes a world of difference. And that's where you really see cracking in a lot of the old paintings. And also keep in mind that the, the old, the paintings that are, you know, from hundreds of years ago or over a hundred years or, you know, the white that they used was lead white, which was a much stronger, formed a much stronger paint film. It actually was a f much faster drying, a much more reactive pigment than titanium is. So if you have a, a slow drying pigment like titanium and you paint on top of it burn umber, even if the oil ratio is higher in the burn umber, you're still going to get cracking because that burn umber over time continues to dry much faster than, than the titanium does and, and, uh, or even than the lead, lead flake white does. So that's the big deal. Um, but, you know, a little bit of crack, cracking in your paint is, it's kind of, you know, if you look, go into any museums, you're going to find it in, in really old paintings. It's kind of the, the nature of oil paint, and I wouldn't go too crazy worrying about fat over lean. Um, you know, uh, so anyway, uh, that's, that's really the big thing to keep in mind. And even, even so, there have been times where I've painted burn umber on top of titanium, and a little cracking ends up showing up after time. And, and you know, if you can avoid it, that's fine. But, um, you know, working wet and wet is certainly the easiest way to avoid the whole problem altogether because uh, even if you paint, you know, burn umber on top of white, wet paint, it becomes one solid layer of paint and it all kind of dries together. Um, so, anyway, without further ado, let me uh, show you how I finished this jar painting. So after drying for about two or three weeks, this painting has become very flat, as you can see, and I'm just oiling it out, um, which doesn't take very much time, and it ma basically makes the painting look like it's been varnished. But it's real important because it lets me see what I've got, because this is what the painting is going to look like um, when it's varnished, and when I start to work on it some more, like I'm doing now, I want to know what that paint really looks like and so that's why I oil it out. Um, so now that it's oiled out, I've started to just lay in some color. Um, the nice thing, of course, about painting wet on dry is that you don't get the underpainting coming up and mixing with your color. So in a lot of cases, um, it's just a lot easier. Uh, the downside, as I've mentioned in other videos, is that you don't get a, a nice blend um, with, uh, with the paint, you know, especially when you start blending into your shadow or whatever. But um, you just, as long as you're aware of that, you can, you know, even use it to your advantage. If I need, for instance, uh, you know, gray is not necessarily a bad thing. So it's uh, not always um, a bad thing that you gray up your color. You know, uh, for instance, right here, I'm making the color much more gray. I'm putting some blue into it. And that underpaint coming through and mixing with the gray, the blue-gray, and you know, makes a nice color. So um, this, uh, I'm just going in and adjusting some of the values a little bit. I think it needs to be lighter. And in the process, I'm changing the color a bit. Um, this tablecloth, I did not attempt to, uh, you know, paint it at all exactly the way I, I see it. You know, as I've mentioned before, um, it's important that, you know, as long as you're getting your values right, it's like magic. You can get your texture all wrong, and uh, you can get your, um, you know, the surface that you paint. As long as it's abstract and as long as your values are right, then it works. And, uh, you know, this tablecloth is a perfect example of that. Now I've decided not to put in some of those deep shadows, and that was a conscious decision um, for the you know end end result that I was uh, trying to achieve. Um, you know I just liked the I just didn't want to put in the dark shadows. I wanted to play with the color a little more than that. So it's not an exact duplicate. And also uh, keep in mind that I'm looking at life. I painted this from life, and you guys are looking at a photograph. And so I know some of the reflections were different um, 
when I uh, when, when I sat down in my chair, for instance, my shirt was reflecting in, into the jar, and that didn't come through in the photograph that you guys are looking at. But um, in general, I think the photo was taken about from my perspective, um, but it, it was a little different. And the other thing is, is that I'm, when you're looking at something in life, uh, the values are going to be a little different because your eye perceives. It's not that a photograph can't do it perfectly. It's just that there's a lot more depth w when you're sitting there in front of a still life. Um, you can look into the dark shadows and see detail. Whereas in a photograph, those, those values will be black, black, and you won't see them. So a lot of times, for instance, I can look into the jar and see things that simply don't come through um, in, in the jar that, that I'm looking at in, uh, in the, or that you guys are looking at in the photo. Some of those blacks, you know, I can look in there and see color um, where, you, where you can't see it in the photograph. And I've got to make a video about that because um, it's easy to misunderstand what I'm saying there. I'm not saying that the photograph doesn't do it perfectly. It's just that when you're looking at something um, from life, you can look into the deep shadows and see color where those values are actually below the range of black. And uh, I need to make a video about it. But, um, you know, and, and in the case of a jar like this, that's actually a, a really big deal, you know. Um, when you look into the, to the dark colors in the glass, you can see some deep blood oranges that you don't see in the photograph. And so as an artist, and this is with experience, and this is sort of advanced, I can play with those deep values just a little bit um, and, uh, you know, still make it look right. And that's why there's a little bit more that you can see in the jar in my painting is because I've brought that out just a little bit. But you've got to be real careful. And I actually advise my students not to, you know, and when you're starting out especially, is don't try to change the values because it'll get you into all kinds of trouble. And I really don't do it much. When you see the end painting, I really don't do it. Um, I just do it in those deep colors. And I'll have to make a video about that. It's sort of an advanced lesson for beginners who are starting out painting and you know, doing my method um, for the first time, I, I highly recommend not um, altering the values or changing what you see, but to really just paint it exactly as the color checker tells you. And I always have to mention this is a, a you know, this video, and you know, and the companion video to it where I painted the first part, um, which now I've let dry, and this is the second layer. But the first layer in that video and in this video, I'm really painting just completely the way that I like to paint. Uh, when I'm teaching people who, to paint for the first time, I very much teach a very different uh, method where you mix your color rows and you check every stroke before you paint it with a color checker. And, uh, when, and you just, you know, when you start off, you, you have to use those uh, those tools because it, it's all about learning to see color. But once you've used those tools for a while, then this is a, this is a, a video to watch to learn from because I'm just winging it, so to speak. I'm just going by instinct. And it's instinct that I've developed over years and years of mixing colors from life with my portrait clients or, or whatever. So these colors um, I'm using, I get asked a lot in the comments. Um, the pigments are titanium white, cadmium yellow, and uh, pyrrole rubine is the red, French ultramarine is the blue, and burn umber is the brown. And those are the five colors that I use. Um, and the, uh, 
you know, all those colors that, that you can use permanent alizarin in place of the pyrrole rubine but these are Geneva colors that already have the medium mixed into them. They're ready to use. Um, and I put as much pigment in this uh, paint as I possibly can. Um, you just can't put any more. And some pigments are a little more transparent than others. You don't want your paint to be, you know, you wouldn't want artist oil color that was just hardcore, um, opaque, where you couldn't get any canvas to show through. Because there's times, especially when you're doing the, the underpainting, uh, where, you, where you let the canvas kind of show through your, your color and it gives you a, a little dance. Uh, you can see it in the bottom part of the plate there where a little bit of canvas is showing through, I believe. But, um, you know, once you get the second coat in, the same thing applies. Uh, if you get a little transparency, then when you paint that second layer, you can sort of play with that. You can either let the underpainting show through more or cover it more, depending on how much paint you use. And in general, when you paint your second layer, you, you really use a lot less paint because, uh, you know, it just doesn't take as much, unless you're changing the color completely or something. Um, and I repainted the, ba the background and made it all fresh black paint. I didn't show a lot of that, but I just re-wet it because um, I wanted the background to basically be black black. So the subtlety is the key here. If you'll notice in the plate, there's a very, very subtle line and it's very easy, and it's something that um, beginners will do all the time, and is to exaggerate that line. I'm talking about that very subtle line in the plate that runs around, and you'll notice how careful I am to keep the subtlety of it. I change it and move it around a little bit, but it's it's always just as subtle, and uh, that's that's one of you know I say it a lot, but the number one what's the difference question. Um, that I ask myself when I'm comparing my painting to the subject. And it were, I should say it's the number one overlooked question or the question that never gets answered. And that is, which is more subtle? You know, is there, if there's a line in my painting, you know, it should be just as subtle. For instance, the edge of this glass that I'm playing with right now, that should be just as subtle. You can see you just completely lose the line on the bottom corner there as it blends into the plate. So mine should also disappear. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm really, I don't, I don't want my edge to be any stronger. And if you lose the line completely, then so be it. Um, you know, as you can see, I've completely lost the, the line on the glass, but the viewer's eye will fill it in. And now I'm trying to put in that, that very light trace of a line in the plate. And it looks like I've got it in the wrong spot, but I guess that's okay. I, when I do still lifes, I change things. If it doesn't matter, then, then it doesn't matter and I don't care. In other words, that line probably could be moved a little bit lower. Um, there's, a, there's a few differences that I noticed in the finished painting. But if they don't bother me, then I leave them out. But the value thing is a really big deal. And if you can, you can see the edge of the rim of that plate as it comes around, it's very slightly more white than, than the uh, inside of the plate. And that subtlety is, you've got to achieve that. It's just something I tell my students over and over. You know, what, where, which is more subtle, your painting or, or, or your subject? And that's really all I'm doing right now is just taking out some of that relief because I don't want to, I don't want this to be, to stand out. It's real easy to paint things. You, you want to see a line. 
you want to, you know, if you see a line in the plate, by golly, you're going to paint it. And that's a mistake. And subtlety of color is just as important. You know, you don't want your cuddle to, your color rather to have more pop than than the subject. Um, there should be just as much gray, just as much uh, you know neutral, um, especially in the shadows. People tend to put more color in the shadows, and this oil is actually an exception. Uh, if you look at the shadow of the plate, you can see how gray it is. But the oil is an exception because it's kind of like a stained glass window. That light is passing through that oil and, and putting in all the, those deep, you know, oranges and deep reds in, in, in the deep shadows. I'm just adjusting the bottom of the value a little bit on the plate and bumping my lines around a little bit. Um, that's another thing that, that's easy to do when you're doing a second coat. I don't mind waiting for my paintings to dry. You know, I like to do a first coat and then let it sit over in a corner and dry for a couple weeks and then come back to it with a fresh eye. It's For me, it's been something that's always been a benefit. Um, you know, if you're trying to meet deadlines or you're trying to finish a painting for a show or whatever, you know, then that's different. Um, then you need to find a good warm place to dry your paintings. If you find a warm spot, like a good a warm attic in the summer or whatever, um, a painting, even with you know this Geneva paint, which doesn't have dryers in it, um, it will dry in you know a few days. And when you put on a second coat of paint, it's not like when you varnish; it only needs to be dry to the touch. Um, there's no, you don't need to wait any longer than that before you put on a second coat. Um, but do oil it out just so you can see what you've got because it can be dramatically different, especially in the darks. You know, blacks will look gray until they're oiled out. So as you can probably tell that those dark colors are just burn umber and you know blue, if you mix burn umber and blue together you, it makes black um, but it's kind of heavy on the burn umber just because I want those reddish undertones. Now there are some areas in the jar that are black black but once I uh, you know as I re-wet this paint I'm going to re-wet it, re it with burn umber. Uh, because I love how the the yellow blends into that burn umber, as you can see right here, or rather as, as the yellow uh, blends into the burn umber, makes a nice orange. I completely missed this little glow under the rim there, and the, the first time I painted this, um, I wasn't. There's a big difference between painting a painting. Um, in the first layer and intending it to be finished and just kind of getting your undercoat. You know, I left the reflection out and that's because I really wasn't worried about it. I knew I was going to do a second coat. Um, it would have looked a lot better if I would have just put a little reflection in there. But as you can see, whenever you put a reflection on glass, it really you know, you almost can't see it as glass until you see that reflection. So 
So now I'm getting in some of those more gray reflections, those very slight little bits of more grayish, more blue. And I think I was seeing more reflection than you guys are in this photo because uh, when I was sitting there in front of it, I know there were several times where I could see my head moving around or whatever it was. I think I was wearing a black shirt, but even then, even so, my face will sometimes reflect in things. It's real tempting to, you know, work with fast drying paints, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, certainly nothing wrong, it's just a different, but in terms of my perspective, you know, I like to basically get my first layer to sort of define the, the, the values, to get in that underpainting and basically get it as close to right it as I can. And uh, the way you do that is you have, um, you know, you have to have the ability to look into something and pick out the value, which is why I recommend uh, you know, mixing colors from life and using a color checker. Um, but, or, you know, you can also have a good photograph. It's not like you have to work from life to learn how to mix colors. It's just that so many photographs are so overexposed, so oversaturated, and working from life, you just can't go wrong. But painting a still life from life in a, in a controlled spot, like in a shadow box where you can sit down and you know, mix your colors and balance your lights and everything, um, it will teach you to see color and then you develop an instinct. Um, and when you, once you have an instinct, you don't even have to balance your lights. You can just sit down and paint anything. You can look out a window where you're inside in completely different light. Look out a window, your eyes adjust, and uh, you can do it. But it's to develop that instinct you've got to do your color charts. And the color charts that I recommend are mixing colors from life using a color checker. And if you've never tried to check your colors before, you know, just go watch my video, how to mix, uh, mix colors from life, or, or how, rather how to mix uh, colors with oil paint or whatever the name of it is um, at drawmixpaint.com. Um, I've got a couple videos on how to mix colors, but my point is, is that when you're mixing colors uh, using a, an, a limited palette like I do, the rules are real simple. If you sit down and you mi match your colors from life, the very first thing that's going to hit you is just the shock, and the shock of, of, wow, I had no idea that the color was, was what it was, you know, whether it's a shadow color or whatever it is. Um, Usually it's the shadow colors that shock people because, um, you know, when you use a color checker uh, or even if you wipe your, you know, paint on your photo, um, you know, it's shocking because you, you get a lesson real quick and it teaches you, you know, where you were wrong and where your perception was wrong. And, uh, and you quickly learn and that's the value of it. You know, mixing colors from life, um, is uh, you know you're not you're not mixing color charts that are arbitrary or made up. Um, they're they're just the colors that you actually see. And the greatest you know if you're an artist and, and you're painting from life or you want to paint realism, you know it is a huge help to be able to look at a vase, you know look at the shadow on that vase and then have an instinct for what that color is on your palette. And I really don't know of any way to develop that instinct unless it's through you know years and years of, of just trial and error. But if you use a color checker, you'll just, you know, you can, you can be mixing perfect colors, you know, in your first try. And that's not a, I'm not kidding. I mean, it's, I've seen it, it's what happens. It's what happens to people who've never painted before. It's just simple rules, a simple flow chart, and you go through it, and you make, and anybody can mix colors. And after you do it enough, you start to uh, get an instinct for it. 
So here I'm finally using something to steady my hand on these, uh, all my lines are getting uh, wiggly. And so I finally gave in and got my, my stick out. One of the things about this um, lid that you'll notice is there's a very, very subtle, I mean it's so subtle you almost can't see it, of this little vertical lines that are, you know, part of the way that the lid was stamped. And I'm going to put just a hint of that. And it's so subtle, but when people look at it, they, the human eye will pick up that subtlety. It's not like you have to overdefine it, you know. If uh, and you can see, I've started to put a little bit. And mine are mine are too strong, but um, you're going to see it's just a little bit of that. What I'm doing right now, I mean, just takes nothing, just to suggest that that those little very slight, you know, um, creases in the metal or whatever it is. So I'm going back to my dark values and making sure that I've got those, those deep values right. Kind of went overboard with my white. And there's a very subtle shadow line that runs down the middle of that band. And it's, uh, it's kind of what gives it the metal look that, that your eyes see, it makes it, it see metal, the, refre or the reflective properties of it. Just that very, very slight vertical brush stroke is all it needed. And in fact, I've made it stronger than it should be, probably, because it's even less subtle. Maybe I was looking at it in life and seeing something different. I don't know. But you can see the temptation to overdefined things, you know, you know, look into that lid and I probably just was so happy and proud of my little vertical crease lines. But they're pretty subtle. So going back in, putting in those dark darks, it's real important. And also, another thing, it's just as important to take out the strength. If you feel like your color has got more pop, take it out. It shouldn't have any more pop in it. Um, you know, of course, you can paint any way you want. But, in my opinion, when you're doing realism, at least to my students who are starting out, I always, um, you know, highly recommend that their color not be any stronger uh, than it is, you know, in their source. So I put in that line, that very slight reflection, which I can't really see as much in, in the photo. But I think in, when I was looking at it, I was seeing maybe something a little more on that edge. But I'm going back in, and I'm taking it out and making sure that my line isn't, isn't, doesn't have a stronger edge. Always maintaining the abstraction, keeping the, the noise in there, so to speak. And now I'm going back in and putting those black blacks deep in the heart of that, you know, lower area. And that's so important because as you work, you tend to milk up your blacks and, and you lose them. 
and uh, it's real important. When I wiggle my brush around like that over my palette, it's because I can't decide what to do. See, that's way too strong. So I'll come back and tone that down a little bit. It's real important. So easy to put a reflection in and, and fall in love with it and think it makes it look even better than your source. But it's not true. In the end, that's what amateurs do. That's what is they they exaggerate everything. And I'm not saying that exaggerating things is, is, is bad. I mean, there's a place for that. But if you're trying to learn to paint realism, um, you know, for me, when I look at all the great realism, those really great artists, you know, they, they know how to paint. It's always the subtlety. And it's just something that I see amateurs do from the very beginning is to exaggerate. And I actually do end up leaving a little bit more edge in my jar than uh, you see in the photograph. But I think it was partly what I was seeing in real life. That's my excuse anyway. So I've decided that reflection is a little too high, so I've got to lower it. So I'm just going to move it down. In the process of, you know, fixing and reworking, there's a point where that can be a, a plus, you know, because you get a little more abstraction, you get more colors, you, you get this jumble of, of various, you know, layers and colors that are poking through and, and it ends up being more interesting. But then if you keep working, it turns to milky mush. And so you have to be careful. Um, and if you ever do see milk, the way to get rid of milk is to put some brown into it because uh, burn umber is the, is the opposite of milk. Always going back and putting my blacks in. It's kind of like my, one of the last things I always do. And defining that edge that's, this is really going to help this jar. And what I'm doing right now, it really needed it. So there it is. There's the finished painting. And again, if you want a chance to um, win this painting, I'm going to give it away to free to somebody. You'll pay for the shipping and ship it right to your house. If you go to drawmixpaint.com, you can find links to all my free videos. If you go to GenevaFineArt.com, you can find out all about the paint that I use to paint with, that I manufacture myself right here in Austin, Texas. And thank you so much for watching.